Hello, everybody. Let me do a quick sound check and see if everybody can hear me. There is a bit of delay, so I'm going to have to wait until I hear a yay from the chat. Oh, well, if you can hear me typing, then you can probably hear me speaking. Yay, they hear me. Um, okay, so hello, everybody. This is the, oh, let me change my screen sign. So hello, everybody. Um, this is the very first JavaScript class that we've done um, through PyLadies DC. And therefore PyLadies Remote. Um, and um, this is actually the first JavaScript class I've ever taught. So you're going to be experiencing a completely new bit of material. Um, so I'm sorry and thank you. So first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Katie Cunningham. I am a Python developer. I work mostly in Python and um, Django. I am not a JavaScript developer. Um, like most full stack developers, I was tossed in the deep end. I took a job um, at a startup and when I started, they said, oh, you'll be doing, you know, Python, Django, this and that, and Angular, which is a framework in JavaScript. And I kind of knew JavaScript. I could, I could kind of like work with it, but it was never anything that I worked with for any more than like a few days. Um, so, of course, I was like, sure, I can do that, whatever. Um, so that is basically what happened to me. So I'm one of many developers who ends up getting thrown into the JavaScript world because that's kind of what full stack is these days. Um, basically, any ticket can be assigned to you. So um, if you bought by the way, if you want to follow along in the um, um, in the on air thing, you should see something with the yellow tags. And the JavaScript class outline is linked there. Feel free to copy it to your own drive and modify it and add your own notes. So, anyway, JavaScript. Um, the history of JavaScript is weird because JavaScript started off um, basically as a language to work with Java applets and browsers. Um, and it's kind of weird because every time I hear a history of JavaScript story, they're all slightly different and sometimes differing in major details. Um, and there's all different names that it goes through and it's a very confusing story. And to be honest, not a whole lot of it matters, but it can um, ease your mind when you think, okay, this was not a language that was put together for a, we're going to use this language to do this broad thing. It was this narrow thing that the language ended up being more powerful than the applets it was supposed to be controlling. Um, so developers like, you know, front of developers really started doing cool stuff with it and that's how it grew. Um, JavaScript is not an easy language. So if you've ever tried to pick it up um, or ever looked at some JavaScript code and went, what the heck is going on here? You are not crazy. It is not an easy language, but a lot of people try to say it's easy. Um, I think because of Stockholm syndrome. And because it started off as a go-between, there is a bit of organic growth um, in the logic. And also, some people thought it was simple. They were like, oh, it's so easy and it's so simple. Um, so they didn't really try to make it simple. Um, or they ignored some of the parts that weren't as simple. And they're like, oh, well, that's just a thing. You just have to learn about that. But you'll discover a few of those as we go along. Um, there were early security issues. Uh, most of those not as big a deal right now. A lot of them have been clamped up. And at the end of the class, we'll go over some of the things that you should do if you want to keep it secure. But the earliest, if you people will come to you and say, JavaScript isn't secure, it's like, oh, you're so 2001. Um, there are also turf wars. That is one of the reasons why it's not an easy language to learn. There were Java developers who wanted to be more like Java. And there were Perl developers who wanted to be more like Perl. And thank God Python wasn't as big then because we probably would have gotten into the mix and everything would have been insane. So that's another reason why it can sometimes seem a little uneven if you're coming from a language that was developed like to be a language on its own and not for this one specific task. Um, it is still worth it to learn JavaScript though. It is, it pairs very well with what many of us do. It pairs like really well if you do web development, um, you know, 
it's just, it's really cool and it's actually starting to bleed into other areas so node js is starting to you know become really popular what is really popular um but it's starting to leak into the python world so if you do python eventually you sometimes have to work with node in some way in some form or another um I always recommend that you learn JavaScript before you learn frameworks. There are many frameworks um, written in JavaScript, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and it's not uncommon to see a developer say, um, oh, I, I know how to use jQuery, but I don't know how to use um, JavaScript. And you're hamstringing yourself because it's kind of like the people that come up and say, well, I can do Django, but I can't do Python. Those developers have a really hard time. And basically all their, their code is like copy paste from Stack Overflow. So learn JavaScript first. You don't need to be an expert in JavaScript, um, but you need to learn the basics first. So some warnings. Um, in JavaScript, in Python, we always say, you know, there should be one obvious way to do things. and in JavaScript, that is not the case. There are many ways to do things. Every time I go into Stack Overflow to say, oh, how I would do this one thing, there are six different answers and they look nothing alike. Um, I'm almost always going to cover just one, but just be forewarned, you know, when you start searching for things, you'll see more than one way. And they're subtly different. There's reasons to go over one for another, but for the most part, and when you're beginning out, just use the one that you're most familiar with and leave that for like when you want to really like level up your skills. Um, I'm going to leave things out. We only have three hours. So I can't go over everything. And um, JavaScript can get subtle, i.e. confusing, really fast. So I'm going to try to keep this as streamlined as possible and as non-scary as possible. Another warning, jQuery is not JavaScript. It's written in JavaScript, um, but it is not JavaScript. However, you will see people conflate the two. Um, I see this all the time on many forms and stuff where they're like, oh, I have this JavaScript problem and it's all jQuery. Just know that when you start searching out stuff, that's extremely common. Um, and occasionally get somebody to go, dude, that's jQuery, not JavaScript, get it right. But some people are just so used to it that they don't even call them out anymore. Um, and last warning, when we say don't do this in Python, it is because your program will break, you know, and it'll usually break pretty quickly. Like, you know, you can't do this. Um, when a JavaScript person says, you know, don't do this, they mean that eventually things might start acting weird. So just know that, that if you're used to a language that's like, nope, we're going to just break and give up now, um, JavaScript is different. It's very subtle. Later on, you'll start seeing really weird things where you're like, why are you doing this? Um, and that's just one thing to be to expect. Um, so this class, um, it's not for beginner programmers. You know, you don't have to be an expert in the language, but we are going quickly. So if you have never touched code before, this is probably not the class for you. This is probably not the language for you. Um, I would recommend starting off with something else like Python or, you know, even Ruby or one of those. Um, JavaScript is actually really hard to learn as a beginner. I know people that have done it, um, but I think that it's a lot easier if you learn a different language first and then move over to JavaScript. And this class is geared towards people who know Python. Um, if you don't know Python, that's fine. I'm just going to make occasional references to the language where I'm like, oh, this is like this, or this is not like this, that kind of thing. Um, you should be able to follow if you know basic programming concepts. Um, but just know that if you don't know how to code at all, there's a good chance you may get lost. Um, and if you do get lost, don't freak out. This is not a class that's meant to go you know, slow and, you know, you know, bit by bit and talk about all the little things. Um, it, you're not stupid, <laughs> you know. This is just not the class that is gonna be good for beginners. So today's tools, we are going to be using Cloud9. This is Cloud9. Actually, this is your dashboard. Um, if you go to c9.io, we'll be using this. The reason I use Cloud9 is because it's a lot easier for me to debug other people's code. Um, and we'll go over how to use it as we go along. Um, but basically it's an online IDE and you can share stuff with me and you can also follow along with my code. Let me get my share link. So, copy. Um, and I'm going to put this in the chat. Do, 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 do. 
Um, and if you can't, if you're not in the chat, it's basically IDE, um, you know, HTTPS IDE.C9.io slash K Cunning slash JS underscore class. And that way you can actually see um, my code and you can copy and paste as you go along. Um, so let's see. Um, and yes, I do recommend because if you want to share with me, it's super easy. You can just share whatever issue you're having with me um, or with any of the TAs that I have today um, or with everybody else. You might just put it out there and somebody may see your error. So today I'll be using Chrome. Um, I will not be using Firefox. I'll not be using Safari. I'll not be using anything else. I'll be using Chrome. Um, please be uniform for my sanity because we're going to be using some of the tools in Chrome in order to like look at code, look at how to do stuff. And they're all browsers have these tools, but they're subtly different. And I don't want to have to explain where each one is in every browser. Don't make me do this. Um, later on, you can go find it on your own. So for Chrome, here, I'm just going to pull up my screen sign. We are going to be leaning heavily on the developer tools. And there's a couple ways you can bring it up. My favorite way, you just alt click and inspect element. You can also go like more tools, develop, developer tools, and then there's like keyboard shortcuts that change by system. So if you've never seen these before, they're great. I love these. Um, it gives you all kinds of information. It tells you, shows the HTML you have. It shows the CSS you're working with, which we're not going to be playing too much with the CSS. So I can just make that small. Um, you know, and you have a JavaScript REPL down here, console. Um, and down here, you can actually type in JavaScript, um, do that kind of stuff with it. So we'll be working with this. Let me see if I can make this. I'm going to make it bigger for y'all so you can see it. I'm going to move. I'm going to make my head tiny. There. And move it up here. There. So this is what we're going to be doing a lot of work in today. Um, I'll only be using these two parts, but seriously, when you have a chance, go over this because there's all kinds of awesome stuff like network, you know, sources like you can look at, you know, um, oh, by the way, AngularJS is on here. I work in AngularJS. This will not be on yours. This is an add-on for me. Um, so there's just a ton of things. Go check it out um, if you've never looked deeply into this. If you do any front end development, this can be a really powerful tool. Um, and a note about add ons I don't have any add ons on this computer, I think. Um, but occasionally you might see like things from other add ons you have pop up in here. Um, so you may want to turn off add ons or just get used to seeing them, um, which is why you may see something on your console that I don't see on mine. So. Let's start out. Gonna get a drink of water. I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna pause for a second to make sure that everybody is okay. Tons of yes, they can hear me. Good, because I've been talking for a while. All right, good. Everybody's good. Looks like everybody's looking at the outline and people are looking at my code. Good. So this is our start page. Um, very basic HTML page. I'm actually not putting any JavaScript in a separate file. I'm just doing it in the same file. Um, so, you know, doc type, HTML, head, blah, blah, blah. Um, body, some text. And here, between two script tags within the body tag, that's where I am going to be doing most of my coding. I'll be doing most of my JavaScript here. Um, so this is what we're starting off with. And in order to run this page, like actually host it so we can see it, you have to click run. And that'll start up a little H um, Apache server. And I can open this in a new tab. So as you can see, nothing too spectacular here. Going to inspect element to bring up the thing. You can see our HTML in here. Um, and we can actually start doing JavaScript now. Um, because the JavaScript REPL is going to be listening to this page. Um, and yeah, I'm, point I'm sorry, I'm pointing at my screen like you can see it, but it's going to be looking at my welcome page. 
Um, so let's start talking about, normally when you have a coding class, like here's how you set a variable, here's how you do a loop, here's how you do an array, here's how you do this, here's a math. I'm going to start with the document object model because quite frankly, the first time I learned JavaScript, um, I went through all of those, like, here's how you do this, and my reaction was, so freaking what? I can't do anything to the page. So we are gonna start off with the document object model, most commonly referred to as the DOM. And um, basically, the DOM is how you manipulate your page. It's how you would change text, and add stuff, and remove stuff, and see if stuff is there, make stuff invisible, that kind of stuff. Um, when you have, and actually I'm going to bring up, where is my pretty picture? Should have had this ready to go. I completely forgot. Oh, nope, wrong person. I want to be me there. My work also used Google Drive, so. Notes. Okay. So in the doc, in the DOM, um, HTML is stored in nodes. So you start off, you have the ultimate parent node, which is HTML. Beneath that, it has two nodes. It could have two nodes. This is an imaginary HTML page. So you may have one that's head, and then you have body. So those are two separate nodes. In body, we start off with a header one tag, and then there's a div tag. And the div tag contains an image and a paragraph. Um, some of these terms we'll start using is child nodes. So body is a child of HTML, as is head is a um, child of HTML. Head and body are both siblings. So you'll see that you can go across the DOM and you can go up and down. So you end up in JavaScript doing a lot of up and downing. You just go down and up and you find, that's how you find things. Um, you can also search through the DOM. So you may say, give me all the header ones, give me all the divs, give me all the paragraphs, that kind of thing. So that is my pretty picture that explains what a DOM is. Let's go back to hello. Um, so first, in our um, in our REPL, we are going to start off by just saying, okay, if I just type document, it's like, okay, you know, here's your document, and it gives me just all the HTML, which not very useful. But if we do document children, it will return the children. And the child of document is HTML. That's like the whole HTML shebang. Um, now let's say we want to have, OK, give me the children of the first item. So basically all this is is a list. You know, So give me the children of the first item. Did that work? No, it didn't. My notes are wrong. Um, so don't worry about it. But so basically, document children is how you get the children of those things. So let's grab something, because it's nice to have children, but we want to actually grab something. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up, so I can just remember, ah, ID title. So var, var is how you're going to be setting a variable. Um, you don't have to do this. It's a good habit to get into. We'll get into that later. Um, so var h1 equals document dot get item no get element by id and I'm going to change my thing. As you can see, it was late when I wrote this. Get element by id. And I want the ID to be title. And if we say, what's H1? No, not history. What's H1? OK, it's the H1. Now, some things about this that I just wrote out. Um, and I'm going to check to make sure nobody's going, oh my god, I can't even see that. Oh, yeah, let me put the video over here. Come here, video. Do, 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 do. Um, Okay. We'll be editing the code soon. Um, so let's talk about this thing right here. Um, var h1 document get element by ID title. So have you ever heard um, people talk about, you know, IDs have to be unique and classes don't have to be unique. 
Um, and we've all broken that rule at some point. Um, I know I did several times when I first started coding because I basically said, oh, I had multiple IDs that were identical. And I'm like, whatever, it didn't break anything. This is what breaks. JavaScript breaks. Doesn't like it, doesn't know what to do. Um, this is why it has to be unique. Um, so, because it's get element by ID, not get elements. So what this does is it goes through and it finds an item that, you know, has the ID of title and it stores that node into H1. So here we have, okay, H1, ID, title, welcome. Bring up my notes again. And we can actually get some information. So if we say H1 text content, and a lot of these will pop up like automatically so you can just tab them. Um, H1 text content, okay. The content is welcome. You know, it says this is what the content is. But you can also do h1 text content, set it to something new. I'm going to set it to high there, and it changed to high there. So text content is both a getter and a setter. Um, you can say what's in it, and you can say, okay, set it to this now. Um, and just stating the belaboring the obvious, this does not change the actual HTML, it just changed the HTML that's stored in your browser. I get that occasion, I get that question. Um, occasionally. So let's make some code. <laughs> Hannah, shush. You may not be joyous. So we are going to make the most uninteractive JavaScript script ever. So we're going to say document dot get element by ID and then ID is title and we're going to set it to hello Hi, ladies. What? What is wrong? What don't you like it? Oh. So var h1 equals this h1 dot text not high. I'm going to screw this up so much because all y'all are watching. Okay, so what we have, um, our title H1, um, it says welcome. Here, I'm gonna set it to hello, PyLadies. I can come over here, reload, and that's all it does. Uh, it sets it, because if I open up the console again and show you the actual HTML, Actually, it'll still, it'll look like hello, PyLadies, um, but it starts off as welcome. Um, a few notes of what I just did. A good habit to get into is having the semicolons at the end of each line. It's a good habit. Um, technically, like JavaScript inserts it it's on its own. Um, I know some JavaScript developers are all whatever, it doesn't matter. And then I have JavaScript developers who will literally like not hire you if you miss like a semicolon. So I would say just put them in there. Um, and it can also help that at least you know, like if something starts acting weird that you don't need to start running through your code and put in the semicolons. Um, and there's some rules about where those go. Like you don't need to put them after um, curly braces. You don't need to go there. Um, don't need to go after functions. They need to go after lines like this, setting variables, you know, getting variables, setting variables, that kind of stuff. So basically we have the most uninteractive JavaScript ever because all it does is it finds a value and it sets it. Um, let's do some proper like coding though, because this is not how you would actually use JavaScript for the most part. So we have our H1 and I'm not going to set the content like that anymore. Um, and we're going to add a function. And the way you define a function is you just say function. So function, um, I'm going to give it a name. There are cases where you don't, but I'm gonna give it a name because that's much easier. I'm gonna call it set title. We're not passing any values into it. And functions are delineated by curly braces. This is not a white space language. This is one with lots of braces and semicolons and stuff like that. So we are going to um, get H1. Actually, we're gonna put this in here. 
If y'all are copying this right now, you might want to wait until I finish actually writing the function, because um, otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy. Um, so we're going to get H1, and we're going to set the text content, and we're going to set it to hello, friend. And that's all it's going to do. So if we reload our page, it just says, welcome. If you go to the console, um, our function name is set title. You can actually call it. So say, OK, set title, which is OK. The function works. It says, hello, friend now. That's awesome. Uh, the problem is, is that this is not how you would actually use JavaScript in the real world. You would not tell a customer, oh, open your console and call a function, and then everything will work. Um, you need to actually like bind it to a thing somehow. Um, so how do we call it from the page? Well, we need to create a listener. So I'm going to add in a button. Button, clicky click. And we're going to give it an ID of clicky. Now, the first thing in our script, we need to actually go get clicky. So var clicky equals um, document dot get element by ID. Get us get a, get clicky. So now we have clicky. And what we can do with Clicky is we can do something called setting an event listener. Um, we basically take Clicky and we say, this is what you do when somebody clicks this or does a thing or mouses over. This is what it looks like. Clicky.set or add. See, this is one of the things you'll start getting into where it's like, okay, it sets sometimes an add and other, and sometimes there's no like set or add. This is the unevenness that comes about. That there are some people that explain it like, oh no, it totally makes sense. It does not make sense. Add event listener. When you add an event listener, you need to tell what are you listening for. I am listening for a click. I want them to click on it. You can also double click. You can mouse over. You can do keyboards. There's all kinds of stuff. You know, focus. You know, move your focus away. That kind of stuff. So when they click on it. I want you to do set title. Do, 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 do. No, no, incorrect there. Now let's see if this works. As I said, remember, I am not a JavaScript expert, so a lot of mine is, oh, right, did I remember the syntax correctly? So we have a button that's called clicky click, and it says hello, friend. If I reload again so you can see it, here's my button. And actually, I'm going to add a little bit of CSS so that makes it easier to see. Uh, color, white, now it's at the border. Border, three pixels, blue, solid. Let's see if that works. You can see I'm also not a CSS expert. OK, cool, that works. Um, so. But you clicky click, it says, hello, friend. And there, it's actually a little bit of interactive JavaScript. So just remember, it's always a three, it's always like a three-step process. You get the thing that you want to actually add, you know, um, that you actually want to add an event listener to. You set the event listener and you create the function that will actually do the stuff you want to have happen. Um, so Oh, and I said for each button, I ended up only doing one. So let me check and drink some water to see. OK. No questions yet. So um, this was really my biggest hurdle to get over. And it can get more complicated, of course, um, because this actually kind of makes sense. OK, one, two, three. Commonly in JavaScript, you are going to see um, everything get condensed. And there's reasons for this, because one thing we're used to as Python developers is that we're like, oh, I know what my server can do. Um, I have this much memory. I have this much pipe. I, I'm i fine. I know what I can do. When you're messing with people's browsers, you don't know how much memory they have. 
And, you know, you don't know, you know, like they may have the fastest computer in the world, but if they're doing a ton of other stuff or they have 5 million tabs open, like some of my friends do because they're bad people, you know, all of a sudden things start scroll crawling, going to a halt. So you need to make JavaScript as efficient as possible. For us, for little apps you write where they're probably not going to be like really intensive, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But you'll often see things condensed and they end up looking something like this. So remove set title from here and instead get something that looks like this. Um, so we get clicky, um, we actually, so we get clicky and then, and I remove this, we wouldn't need it anymore. And they just go ahead and say, yeah, I'm going to add an event listener and I'm just going to create the function here. It's an anonymous function because it doesn't have a name. Um, these are basically created and thrown away the second they're like called, they just, and it, it's more efficient for our browser. Um, if you find this really hard to look at when you're just starting out, don't worry about it. Um, eventually, this will become second nature. If you want to create separate functions, that's fine. There are people that argue that it's much easier to, like when you have them separate, that it's easier to test and it's easier to work with. Um, just, we'll get into like the JavaScript community later. And, you know, the argumentative that, you know, there are lots of different opinions. Um, so, now another thing we can do, like let's make sure this actually works before I say, hey, look, okay, it works. And there is another way to do this, which is gonna get even more complicated. I'm going to delete that. We're gonna say this, and I'm gonna see if this works before I teach it to you. Ah, it didn't work. I'll teach that later. Um, basically, you will see people use this, and this means the thing that you just worked with. So, um, for some reason it didn't work, I am not gonna worry about it right now. Um, because I actually think I put that too early. Okay, so I'm gonna give myself a note. Do, do, do. There. So now that we're going along, we've done all this stuff, let's talk data types, because now we know how to mess around with an HTML page. We can talk about data types for a little bit. And after I talk about a few of these, after I talk about arrays and objects, I'm gonna take a quick break so people can go grab more coffee or whatever they need to do. And so I can drink more water. Um, so arrays, um, when you talk about JavaScript lists, you talk about arrays. Um, and making an array is really easy. So var my list equals one, two, three, four. There. Um, and if we look at my list, it's one, two, three, four. Now that undefined, you'll see pop up in console. There's a reason it does that. I don't care. Uh, it just does that. If you ever see like an undefined pop up, but every else, everything else seems to be working, when you're working in the REPL slash console, don't worry about it. It's just a thing that happens. So. We can get the length of a, of a list. So we have my list dot length. You don't need to call it. It just does it, unlike Python. Um, you don't, there's no len. Well, I think there is a len, but this is how you would get the length. Um, if you do my list dot push, we're gonna put a six on there. Okay, now we have a six. You'll notice that it returns values sometimes. Um, that's usually, I think, the length. You know, there's still, it'll return like random things at times. Um, as I said, and don't worry about it unless you know it's starting to break things. Um, we can also pop. Pop will remove from the end. So if I say what's in my list, we just removed the last value. Pop also returns the last value. Um, and you can, you know, my list dot sort. You do have to call this, uh, which was already sorted. So I'll show you reverse.
and then I'll call sort again. So there. Um, so you can reverse it. And by the way, reverse just reverses the order. It does not do it in like descending order. Um, so you can sort, you can reverse, you can add things, you can remove things. And just like Python and pretty much every language I've ever run across out there, um, indexes start at zero. Um, and actually, let me see if negative one works. Yeah, neg negative one doesn't work. Sorry. Um, so it works pretty much like Python. There's a few things that you know you might be used to um, that are not going to be in the same place, but that's just how it is. Um, there's lots of other things. If you just do my list dot, a nice list of things should pop up. So concat, um, you could actually smush two lists together. So if we do my list dot concat with a list of 79 and 80. We now have a list that includes 79 and 80. Um, so there's lots of different things. Um, there's a 4-H, we'll get into that later. Um, index of is a great way to search list. So it's the index of four, it's three, okay. Um, this is just one of the things when you, I like it because you can actually just go and look through each one of these and figure out like what each one does and just play around with it. Um, those are the major ones though. Um, being able to search it, being able to get stuff out of it, remove stuff, that kind of stuff. So let's go over objects. Now objects sound really scary and um, you know, normally this is like at the end of the class I would talk about objects, but all objects are in JavaScript is a dictionary. So like they're really easy um, with a little bit of extra functionality. So they're very cool. Um, so an object might be, you know, let me create an object now. Um, actually, let me go over here and create an object because it'll be easier for everyone to see. I'm just going to create a new file. I'm going to save it as, come on, um, myobject.json. Um, JSON files, basically JavaScript um, object notation, that is, you know, the format for objects. You can also just have them in the file. Um, so, but that's where JSON comes from, um, does come from the JavaScript world. So I can say, okay, one is set to one, two is set to two, three is set to four, just to screw people up, that kind of thing. You know, we don't have like any um, quotes on these. You don't need them um, on the keys. It's just a quirk of JavaScript. So that's how they do it. I'm gonna copy and paste this over here. Dirt. And let me see if I'm actually right about that. Cause normally you don't, D equals, okay. So, um, you know, so we can say, okay, we have a we have a, a um, an object now, and I can't, I have to force myself not to call them dictionaries, because <laughs> I really want to. Um, but we now we have a JavaScript object object called D, and we can do some stuff with it because um, it's still key value pairs. Um, so if you want to access one of the items and you know what it's called, you do not have to do D with the um, brackets, the square brackets. You just say D one is one. D2 is two, D3 is four. Um, you know, and you can also access them if you don't know what it's called and you need to use like a variable later. Um, D of one is one. So there's two different ways to access them. Um, you can also say, okay, what are my keys for D? and that'll return all the keys. Note that this is a um, built-in function. It is not a function off of objects. Um, we can also say, what are my values of D? And there, we have like all the values um, that are in there. So keys, values, pretty similar. Um, you can also store functions in objects. I'm not gonna do that right now, but just know that is a thing you will see. Um, it's very, very common. So right now I'm going to take a quick break so I can get some water and I can check out the um, chat. So let me set my sign up. And it is 1020, so we'll say 10. 30 EST. 
and I'm going to close this so y'all can see it. All right, see you in a bit.
Okay. I am back. And let's talk about equality. Um, equality in JavaScript is going to usually work in exactly the same way as it does in Python. So you'll have two equal signs, you know, does something equal the other thing? One equals equals two is false. Note that this is lowercase f and it'll also be lowercase t. So expect this to completely screw you up if you're moving between, like I normally do, I'm moving between my Django backend and my Angular front end. All this gets like messed up. Um, and I'm very glad that I get the syntax highlighting because it clues me and it's like, no, stupid, you are in Python now um, or you are in JavaScript now. Um, so just know that, that it's lowercase f false, lowercase t true. So two equal signs do two things equal each other. Um, bang equals, you know, you know, that is does not equal greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, that kind of stuff, all the same as in Python. However, something you're going to see and is this. One equals 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 five. Now, what do the three equals mean? Because this drove me crazy when I first started um, JavaScript. It was basically when you do just the two equals, JavaScript will do type conversion. So if we have five equals equals, five in quotes, so now it's a string, it returns true. This will screw you up so bad. <laughs> like so many times this messed me up. What happens when you have the three equals? No, three equals. It does not do type conversion. So two equals is, are they close enough? And three equals is, no, are they exactly equal? So that's something to be aware of. Um, and you'll see this occasionally, and sometimes if something's acting wonky, I'll just go ahead and add that extra equals. Now, the way you would do this um, is that if you're doing does not equal, you add an extra equal um, in there. So, that's how you just add an extra equal if you need it. But that's why you will sometimes see the three, most of the time you'll see the three equal signs. That's what you're actually looking for. So that's your first bit of JavaScript weirdness. Um, so now that we understand equality, uh, and yes, I kind of breezed through that. I'm gonna clear my console. Um, and I'm actually gonna make it bigger. Get up there, get up there, there. Um, let's talk about loops. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a list and my list is going to have colors in it. Um, so colors equals red, green, blue. So I have colors. And you know, I didn't put var there. I will sometimes do that. You'll catch me doing like things like that. Um, and I'll explain var later, like why it's important. Um, but yes, that's a bad habit of mine. Um, do as I say, not as I do. So we now have a loop. So let's say we make a for loop. So for, we have to put the thing that we're, you know, foring in some um, parentheses. So for color in colors. And the way we define like the loop, ah, sorry. Um, we're just going to do console.log color. And I'm going to explain each bit of this. So let me explain each part of this. So for color and colors, you need to have those in parentheses. You don't need the semicolon. Um, you define what you're actually going to be doing for the, for the block for the for loop within um, curly braces. Console.log is basically our print. So that basically takes something and it prints it out to the console, um, which is great for debugging. There are better ways to debug, but when you're just starting out, console.log is your friend. Now let's talk about what it actually did. Um, it printed out zero, one, and two. So it printed out the index for each one. I cannot count how many times I have screwed this up. Like I forget that it's not going to iterate through the items, it's just going to give me each index. Um, so, and I'm going to check something really fast to see if this is a thing we can do. 
Yes. Um, sometimes you will want to put var in there. Actually, many times you'll want to put var in there. So here I have four var color in colors. Var makes a local variable. It basically obeys scope. Um, if you don't put the var in there, you're creating a global variable, which is totally bizarre to me. Um, so it does not obey scope. And this can start doing some really crazy things if you're doing anything with asynchronous um, like applications, which is mostly what you use JavaScript for. So if you go out and make a call and then you want to go through and you know do this all this crazy stuff, things can start to get really messed up, which is why I say make sure to remember var, because it's one less thing to debug. Um, so let's see. So that and you know basically goes through index numbers. So it's pretty easy to just say, okay, if we do, you know, give me the color of colors, you know, red, green, blue. So easy. Um, the other way to do this is um, to do for each, which can look a little weird. So colors dot for each, and I'm looking up here to get like to actually see what um, the stuff is, uh, what the code looks like. So colors for each, we want to do a thing. It has to be wrapped in a function. And we're going to pass into the function um, whatever ends up being passed to the function, which we'll see in a second. And we're going to console.log, no. Whatever that thing was. All right, so let's talk about this. So basically, you say, you know, my list dot for each do this function. And what's passed into it is the items. This actually iterates through the items. Um, some people, once you're used to JavaScript, this becomes really natural. It looks really like, okay, that's what it does. Um, when I first started out, this looked completely foreign. I was like, what, why do you have to do this? Um, so use the one that makes you more comfortable, but know that this exists um, and try to work up to like, you know, being able to use both. Um, so let's see. Oh, also let's make a dictionary and see what happens there. So I'm gonna make a quick dictionary and we'll give it our one, one, actually no, We're going to have red, is an apple, blue is this, I'm already messing it up. Red is an apple, blue is the sky, yellow is the banana. So we have a dictionary, cool. So for I in var, I in D, console.log i. In this case, it will iterate through the actual like keys. There is no for each. Um, you don't need to use for each for this because it'll actually go through the keys. So just be aware of that. Um, let's see. We do have while loops. So we're gonna set var i to zero. While I, while I is less is less than four. Do stuff. Console. Dot log. I. Oh, and by the way, in the console, I often just put everything on one line because uh, hitting enter, I get into a bad habit of just hitting enter, and then it spews errors at me. Um, and we're going to do I plus plus. And so cool, it does that. Um, um, so basically, a while loops works exactly, almost exactly the same as it does in Python. Um, you can also do a do while loop, which I always miss when I move to other languages. So do this thing. Uh, so we're going to set i to zero again. And we're going to say do. And we're going to say console.log i i plus plus 
while i is greater than i is less yeah i is greater than four we'll just make it run once so it does actually run once because um, you can see it starts off at zero so this last conditional statement this boolean statement here is false but it will run at least once it'll start um, i always miss these other languages have these python does not um, i've always kind of missed it because sometimes you just want something to run once you know at least once um, so, and by the way, there's also break and continue. If you're used to those in Python, they exist. They work exactly the same. So continue will just move to the next iteration of the loop. Break will break the loop. Um, so if you have like a really complex conditional set, you know, there's lots of things that could break the loop. You just go ahead and you can put in those breaks. Um, and you can also use continue. Exactly the same as Python. Um, so. Well, I'm going to check the chat real fast. Do, 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 do. Everybody's talking about delivery sushi. Okay, cool. No big issues. All right, let's get back to the DOM because we've been doing lots in the console, but we haven't, you know, really gone back and done stuff here. So, um, one other thing we can do is I'm going to add in some more paragraphs here. So, and this is a really nice um, shortcut with IO9. If you say lip, come on, lorem, that's right, it's not, it's, if you say lorem, ah, you get lorem ipsum. Do, 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 do. Give me another paragraph, lorem. More lorem, there we go, cool. So I've got a lot of text here. Let's just make sure that it's showing up. Lots of text. So one thing we can do with this uh, lots of text um, is we can say document.getElements by tag name. No, no, get back here. Um, so I can say document get elements by tag name and it will return a list of all the things with that tag. So basically you pass in a string for that tag and it'll pass back everything that you would want. Um, so actually let's save that. Um, paras equals var paras equals this. What's my paras? Paras dot length. We have three paragraphs, which is true. I have one, two, Three, okay. Um, so that is a way you can get all elements by their tag name. This is a really great way to go out and get all the buttons, get all of this other stuff that you want. Um, we can also do set attribute by style, set attribute style. So let's say I take, I want that first paragraph. So my para is going var para equals paras I just want that first one. So here we have para. Para dot set. Set attribute. And to set an attribute, um, let's say we want to set style. And I think then we give it the thing we want to style. So color blue. The textual text we want. No, color, let's see if this works. Yeah, okay, it turned blue. Uh, actually, that's hard for you to see. I'm gonna set it to red. There, now you can see it. Um, so this is a really great way, if you wanna muck around with styles in just like little tiny ways, um, this is a great way to do it. Um, so I can actually add this, I'm gonna make a, script. So I have var clicky. I'm said I'm gonna say set color. Um, so we already have set title. No, set no color. And we're getting our H1 already and the H1 set attribute style 
and the text that we want it to be. So style is um, color is red. Here, now if I clicky clicky, now our title's in red. Um, so this is a nice way you can just muck around with styles. Um, another thing, oh, one thing, a warning about this is that um, it is it will actually overwrite the style each time. Um, so if you say, like, let's say I have it, you know, set it to italics, and then later on something else wants to set the color to red, it will actually, like, um, overwrite things. So you want to be careful about making sure, like, are there any styles that do I want to overwrite them? Do I want to get them? Um, if you're doing something hugely complex, there's probably a better way to do it by setting classes on things. But that is, so I think that we can actually add a class. We're going to add a class called uh, do, 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 do. As you can see, my CSS is also wonderful as I'm blanking out on like the class thing. Um, so the class red, and we're just going to set the color to red. Actually, I'm gonna set it to pink so we can differentiate. Do, 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 do. Class. And is it still called right up here? It probably is. Oh, well. Ah, I made a noise. Okay, that didn't work. There it goes. Okay, now it's pink. I forgot the dot. Um, so you can actually set the class, so that might be a better way to do it than actually just adding the style because eh, styles like set on HTML attributes kind of evil, so don't do it. Um, try not to do it if you can, if you can help it. So uh, let's see, we set attribute. Um, we already went over, you don't have to write a separate function for each event listener. Um, you can condense things down like we did before. Some people find this a lot harder to read. So I'm gonna have the functions set out on their own. Um, so we can also append a child. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually remove these paragraphs. I don't need all this text. Remove paragraphs. Go away. And I'm going to add an unordered list, but it's going to be empty. And the ID for it is going to be my list. So we have an unordered list. If we hit reload, OK, you can't actually see it because there's nothing in it at the moment. Actually, I'm going to add it beneath the button. My apologies for everybody who's frantically trying to like copy and paste as I move everything around. But so we are going to get, we already have clicky, but instead this time we are going to get our unordered list equals document dot get element by ID my list. And we're not going to set the attribute this time. Um, and I'm going to call up my list because that's going to get me really confused. Changing this to add item. I'm going to change this to add item. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and just kind of show you how this works and then I'll put it into the actual code. So no, reload you. There we go. So my list is actually you can mess around with the variables that you've set. Um, and here we have my list. My list is an unordered list. My list dot let's see append child. 
this is something you can do. But there's actually more than one step for this. So first, we need to actually create a thing to add. So var um, my new list item equals document dot create element. I'm going to create a list item. And I'm going to set the text for this. Item. Oh, I keep forgetting you don't call it. All right. Now we can take our, our list, my list dot append child and the item we just created. Because if you see, there's no actual item. Like it doesn't live anywhere. Um, the HTML knows it's kind of hanging out there. You know, JavaScript has it ready to go, but we haven't told it where to put it yet. We have to put it somewhere. We have to append it to something. And ta-da, there's an item. Um, so you can use this to add items. So let's do that. Um, so every time we call add item, we want to create a list item with document.create element we have to give it the tag no 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 we have to give it the tag we want a list item um list item dot set no text content equals item and my list dot append child list item and add in all the things. Let's see if this works. So right now we have an empty unordered list, but if we click, we can keep adding items forever. So we have all these items, we can just click the button and it'll keep adding items. Um, so this is a way you can take forms if you need to dynamically add more um, lines to a form. If you've ever filled out a forms and it gives you like five, you can actually just add them, you know, willy nilly. So this is, you know, a very useful thing to know how to do. Um, this is also great if you're making like a list app of some kind. Um, it's probably one of the most used things that I use is just removing and adding items, which speaking of, we can remove children. So we're going to make a second button. which will require a little bit of refactoring. So add, remove, do, 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 do. and I need to make a second one. Do, 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 do. Add item, add, var remove, document.getElementById, remove, Oh my goodness, all the people copying my stuff. Copy you. Best coding ever. Move item. So we have a my list and we do not need that. List item. Actually, I'm gonna go over here and play around with it for a second. So my list, my list children who are my children do um ch equals my list dot children of my list dot children dot length minus one Think this is right. Well, not this way. I need square brackets. Ch my list remove child the child. So okay, that's the 
thing I need. So basically what you have to do is you actually have to say which exact one. Now I know this looks like we just have a bunch of list items that are just rolled out there. They are not the same. They each have their unique nodeness. They have their unique ID. Well, they don't have an ID that we would know about. We can't see it. Um, we can kind of see it. There's a way to do it. But basically there is, you know, each one is unique. So what I'm going to do, we get the list, we get the child equals my list dot children. And we just want the last one, so we get my list dot children dot length minus one. Remove child and remove that child. Get all of our semicolons, no, semicolons in place. Let's see if this works. Return, so we're gonna add. Okay, I've added for, and I've removed things. So it'll keep removing them. Um, this is useful if you have a form where you wanna remove fields, you know, or you wanna say, okay, I want fewer of this thing. Also useful in games and that kind of stuff. Um, so adding and removing child, very useful. Um, a little bit more about event listener stuff, because we've been doing a lot of just like, okay, when they click on this thing. And I wanna show you, there is a page, it's in the class notes. Um, there are a few links in the class notes that these are all the things that the events that you can listen for. Not everything works in every browser. So be very careful about these. But you have things like, you know, um, did the animation end? Did it start? Um, what's the audio doing if it's an audio thing? Um, double clicking, that kind of stuff. If you really want people to like hate you and make them double click on things, um, or if you're making an app for like that elderly, elderly relative who's like, no, we double click on everything. That's you know something you can do. Um, you can also do stuff with key press um, and on load. I actually have an example with on load. So I'm going to stop running this process. I'm going to open up a new file. It's called on load and it's open now. Um, I have this huge picture um, that I found. And the reason I did it is because I wanted to actually take a time, it needs to take time to load. So let me run this. So we actually have Apache running. Now this doesn't, it doesn't look like it did anything. Oh, I'm gonna need to move my head. It doesn't look like it did anything, uh, but that's because this is all cached. I think it might do it on a hard, uh, see it says loading, 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 loading. Dun, 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 dun. Loaded. Let's talk about the code. So here we have an image with the ID of mountains. It is actually, it's a very big picture. I found like a huge picture. And we have a paragraph with the ID of loading with the text loading. The script, first we get the image, mountains. Then we get the loading paragraph. Um, we add an event listener to the loading paragraph. When the page is loaded, then we say loaded. Everything has been loaded. Um, I don't. I didn't really need the image. You can actually add the event listeners to like the image itself, or you can do it to the page. Um, but basically, when the page is loaded, then or no, I'm sorry. Let me start over uh, because my cursor I couldn't see what I was doing. Um, so we have the image and we have the text. So we listen on the image for when it is actually loaded. Um, and when it is loaded, we call the function loaded, which changes the text content to loaded, um, which I will run it one more time so you can see it doing it, which I did a hard refresh to get it to work, um, which if you're not familiar is, I think shift command R on Chrome. Um, Useful thing to know if you do any front-end web development, hard refresh is your friend. Um, that or private mode. So that's how that works. That's extremely useful. If you want to say, not let somebody click on a complex form until everything's loaded. I have this problem currently that I have a page that requires many, many calls to go out. And depending on how fast servers are being that day, 
you know, it may take a couple seconds and I don't want them clicking on the form until it's fully loaded. So we have a nice little loading gray screen where it kind of puts the invisible pane of glass in front of your, um, in front of your browser and says, no, you can see kind of what's going on, but you can't touch anything. And then when the everything's loaded, pop, it loads. So I can actually, I say, remove the screen, let them do stuff now. So very useful. I'm going to stop you. And let's see. And I'm going to take a second to look. Okay. Color is not equal color. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. American. We don't have the U. I like the U. I wish we had used the U. Um, that was on load. This is key press. Um, key press is the next thing. Yeah, there's a few things that I kind of wrote up things in advance because I didn't want to have to remember everything. Um, so let's run this first. Do, 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 do. Bring up the window. And this isn't going to look really amazing until I start typing things out. I'm not even going to try to like, you know, basically, as I type, it's capturing the text. Um, what this is doing, um, I have a paragraph ID of text. It has nothing in it. Um, the first thing we do is we get that element, txt. Then we add an event listener. And here's one where you see I smooshed everything together, which is really common. You will see this all the time. Um, I added an event listener called key down. Then I have a function. And it accepts something called an event. Um, the event is basically information. It has all this crazy information about like the key that was pressed and all this stuff that, you, that generally happens. Um, so for the text, for our paragraph, the text content equals whatever the previous text content was, plus um, here I use some JavaScript functionality. String is a string library from char code event dot key code so we have to get the key code and we have to pass that into string to get the actual thing that was pressed because that's not a part of event event just says like all the keys on your keyboard have a number um, they have a number and a type so if you press f it might be key 114 um, this can also change by country which is why you want to use some kind of library to figure it out for you um, the reason it changes per country, um, UK boards, UK keyboards are completely different. They have different bindings. Even though they're in the same like order, they have different numbers for certain things. Um, we run into this into the kids' coding classes I do. Raspberry Pis are loaded in the UK and then sent to us, or they're used a load that was created in the UK. And so we have to basically tell the kids, uh, don't use double quotes ever <laughs> because they're at signs. Um, and I... I finally got tired of resetting every single keyboard, every every single like Raspberry Pi. So that is how that works. Um, I have been talking for half an hour. I'm going to take a short break so I can drink some more and see that everybody else is doing fine. And I'll be back in five minutes.
Okay. Two and one more minute, and we'll get started. There we go. Okay. So we're back. And I'm going to get back to my original. We can get off of key press, go back to this one, run you. So hello will work again. All right. So let's go over some other functionality in JavaScript. There's lots of libraries like Python. Um, for many of them, you don't actually have to import them. They're already just kind of there. Um, and that's just one of the, the features of JavaScript, um, that we don't have to import libraries. They just kind of sit there waiting for us to use them. So the first one is math, capital M math. Uh, if you ever see something that's like capital letter blood and then they start doing stuff, that's generally a library of some kind. So capital M math, we can use it to get a random number. And this will just give us a number between zero and one, not inclusive. So you'll never get zero, never get one. You will get some kind of float in between the two. Um, unlike Python's random library, there isn't like, oh, get a random integer. Oh, get a choice. You have to write a lot, uh, which is why you tend to have um, either you use a library that does this for you, or you have your own little library of things you use quite often. So that's math.random. Um, math.floor, no, math.floor, so let's give it um, 0 0.5, I'll give it 1.5, returns 1, so it just lops off, it rounds, but it always goes down, so even if it's like 1.9, you'll get 1. To do proper rounding, it is math.round. If we give it 1.5, we get 2. If we give it 1.4, we get 1. So just remember your elementary school, like, rounding rules, you know, when it goes down and when it goes up. Um, so those are some math functionality that I tend to use, and I tend to use them quite often in trying to generate random numbers. So I'll get a random number, and then I will round it. Um, so, you know, I'll get, you know, multiply it by 10. So often you'll see, I do a lot of, like, games. Um, so I'll do math.random times 10, no, there. By the way, if you see NAN, that means not a number. Not a number is a weird quirk of JavaScript um, because there's lots of ways that JavaScript can say, I don't know. And undefined is one, not a number is one. It's not quite an error. Um, which is what always throws me off, that it's not quite an error, so sometimes it'll try to keep on working with it, which is one of the weirdest, as you'll see, kind of cascade down, because at some point you got not a number. Um, but here we got, you know, we can get eight, and then you can also take this, and I'm doing a math.round on it. So that gives me a nine, five, three, five. That's how I would get, you know, a random number. So you have to kind of write some of this stuff yourself and do mathy bits on your own. Um, or you call a random number API if you're really feeling like I don't want to mess with this. There's also dates. I'm going to clear my console. And date, like if we do date tot, if you just do new date, you get today's date. Um, you have to do new, like it's a date object, and you have to say, give me a new one. Um, you don't have to explicitly say this in Python, but you do in JavaScript. So you say new date. Give me, you know, just a new date. And it says, okay, right now it's July 19th, 2015, 1113. Um, you can also create dates. So let's say I want a new date, but I want it to be 2015 um, and five. Five would be the month. And it's uh, actually, it's the month, um, the index here does start at zero. So January is zero and up, um, which is not how it's done in Python. So just be aware of that. So here we got um, Monday, June 1st. Just assumed we wanted June 1st um, at midnight. We can also say, no, I want the 10th. Okay, now it's June the 10th, 2015. It gives us like the day of the week. Um, but if you do this, just a year, 
when you would assume that, okay, the assumption would be you're going to give me January 1st. And you get Wednesday, December 31st, 1969, um, you know, at 7 o'clock, which, so you get the epic. Um, and this is like one of those moments that you say, like, what? And there is a great talk. It's in the notes. Um, Destroy All Software um, has a talk called What? W-A-T. And I link to it. It's a great watch if you're going to do any JavaScript development. It will go over some of the quirks. Um, also, if you read any comments that you find anywhere to this talk, you will have a million JavaScript developers saying, well, actually, this is why it works that way. Um, but if you're a Python developer, that talk makes you feel less dumb. And you're like, oh, okay, so that really doesn't make any sense. Um, he also go over, goes over Ruby too. Um, but yeah, a lot of these are, it's a, it's a great moment where you're like, okay, I'm not crazy. Uh, let's go over timeouts. I love timeouts because as I said, I'm a game developer in my like paid for day job. Um, so I actually make little games, which requires timeouts because sometimes you want to show like a little screen that says, aha, you did this thing correctly. Um, and you want to wait long enough for the person to read it, but you don't want them to have to dismiss it like every single time. So you want to just have it up there for a few seconds. Um, for this, I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to remove a bunch of stuff. So do, 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 don't need any of you. Just going to delete all of you. And I'm going to do is just have one button called wait. So first thing, I'm going to get my button var wait equals document get element by ID, wait. So now we have our button, wait. And we are going to see. Hold on a sec. Okay, I got it. So we're going to wait dot add event listener um, on going to call waiting. No, just waiting. And and you'll have to excuse me as I'm trying to remember how to do this. And Angular is a much easier way to do it. So reverting in my head. Um, so wait, we're going to add event listener. We actually have to create our function now. So function waiting. We don't need anything for waiting. And the first thing we're going to do is You'll have to excuse me for a second as I'm sitting there going, this makes no sense from what I did. So we call waiting, going to set the timeout, and we have to do Yeah, we're gonna see if this works, or I might pull up some docs to cheat. Um, so set timeout. And we're going to set wait dot text content equals done. Wait dot set text content equals Timeout, we've got our function, and we'll do it for 5,000. So I think I've got this set up correctly. 
but we'll see. Waiting, waiting. Oh, it worked. Ha <laughs> ha, yay, I know how to JavaScript. So I'm actually gonna move, change this from 5,000 to 1,000. Reload, waiting, done. Okay, so let's talk about what this did. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so we have a button, we've called it wait, and I'm gonna change this to click me. So the first thing we do is we get the actual thing we're going to click. We're gonna call it wait. So we get the element by ID. We're going to add an event listener. Um, when they click, call waiting. The first thing we do is we change the text content to our, of our button to waiting. Then we have this timeout thing that, you know, the window dot set timeout. And if you could do me a favor, if you've selected a bunch of text, deselect as soon as you've copied it. Um, Cause I'm getting like, it's now becoming really hard for me to read. Um, Cause as you can see, I can see everyone who has selected everything. So, um, so we have wait, um, window set timeout, do this thing, do this function. Um, and basically what we're gonna do is we're going to set the text content to done, but only after a second, because this last number here, this thousand is milliseconds. So after a thousand milliseconds, so one second, we're going to set the content to done. So dun, 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 dun. Um, and we can just keep doing that. Waiting, done. Um, and I'm going to say this in chat. Okay. I wonder if reloading it will help me out in me. Ah, nope, all y'all are back. Okay, anyway, um, at least it seems like it's visible on the actual screencast. So, so that's a timeout. Now, what is window? We haven't used window before. Um, a good way to think of window is window is the browser window. Um, document is actually a subset of window. So if we go over here to hello, let me say, okay, what's window? It says, well, this is your window. If we say window dot document, it gives us the same stuff as document. Um, and they are literally the same thing. So if you do window equals equals doc, window dot document equals window, they don't, no. No, of course they don't equal document. They are totally equal. They're the same thing. It's just a nice shortcut that you can access document directly without having to go through window. Um, so what is window? Um, window is your browser window and it has a lot of really cool stuff in it because um, documents just all the HTML and window is like above that. It's like all this cool browser stuff and there's a lot of stuff in there and it's both awesome and evil. So just be warned. Um, one of the things you can do is you can turn scroll bars off and on, um, which, you know, I love it when a website turns off my scroll bars. You know, that's just my favorite thing. Don't do that. Um, and I know it's less of an issue now because now most browsers actually hide them if you're not currently browsing, like you're not currently using them. But back in the day, or older browsers, or browsers on Linux, because who needs UX, um, will keep those up all the time. So that's one of the things you can do. A very cool thing we can do is speech synth synthesis. And I don't know if any of you will be able to hear this, but I'm going to bring up a code pen. And it's in the um, JavaScript outline under speech synthesis. So code pen is really cool. You can have basically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you can create these little mini like HTML pages to show off stuff. And I'm going to show off what this person did. I will warn you right now, 
um, a lot of the stuff in Windows and Window may not work on every browser. So if this doesn't work for you, it's probably just because, you know, um, you have one of the browsers that's not supported. So, and it'll say here, like, your browser supports speech synthesis. So, yay. Um, I'm going to say, hello, Pi ladies. The voice, these are, um, I'm on a MacBook right now, and these are all Mac sounds. And actually, Google also has its own, like, um, speech. So you can set the volume, the rate, the pitch, and it can speak. No idea if you heard that, but it sounded very, very nice. Woman's British voice saying, hello, pie ladies, and actually not screwing it up. There you go. Um, so go ahead and bring up CodePen, and I'm going to talk about the code. So if you want to play with it, um, do, 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 do. I'm going to get to the actual, like, there's lots of stuff up here. I'm in the JavaScript module the moment, because I'm going to just make these small so we can talk about this one. Oh, I can close these. Cool. Yay. Um, going to move my head. Come here, head. Get over there. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is we're going to get some of the stuff. And you don't need to worry about this. It's basically getting the content of various forms. And here is where we're actually using speech synthesis. Um, under load voices, we can use speech synthesis to go and get all the voices available on your computer, which is going to vary based on OS um, and browser. Because as I said, um, Chrome comes with some voices. I believe Firefox does too. Um, hold on a sec. My dog has to go kill like our delivery man. My apologies. I am the owner of a very fierce miniature schnauzer who does not like anybody coming to our door. So he will bark until he the person is gone. So anyway, where were we? Um, so speech synthesis dot get voices uh, da, da, um, will actually get all the voices on your system. We need to load the voices in order to use them. Um, let's see. And speak. The first thing, this is the most important thing um, that you should understand. You have to create a speech synthesis utterance. So you basically create a thing which could be spoken. It's like creating like a tape or an audio file, that kind of thing. Um, so you create it first in order to speak it. You can't just say, say this speech. Um, and then, you know, here's some things you can set the volume and stuff like that. Um, and the really important line 78, window.speechsynthesis.speak, the speak, the utterance that you just created. It's a little complicated. There's a lot of different steps you'll discover with JavaScript. There's often not a short way to do things that you might be used to in other programming languages. Um, so you go ahead and then you say the message. And that's how it works. I wonder if anybody is able to do, actually do it. Do, 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 do. No. Um, so that's how that works. Let me. 
Okay, good. Still working. All right. Um, so speed census is very cool, may not work in every browser. Um, you can also do alert if you want people to hate you because we all love alerts. So let me do it over here. Window dot alert. Hello. See, it pops up one of these great things that we all love. You can also do window dot confirm. Hello again. And with this one, if you hit OK, you get true. If you hit cancel, you get false. Um, use alerts and confirms with extremely, like, you know, carefully think about whether you want to use them or not because they're kind of considered um, bad form. Um, you can also scroll, which is kind of cool. I'm going to update my page again and add in some paragraphs. Lorem. Because I want my page to be nice and long. Let's make sure my page is long. Okay, cool. Window.scroll. Let me see, I think 10, no. I didn't put in notes on how to use it. Um, no dot scroll X ten. <laughs> now I finally have to look something up. Window dot scroll. What is the other thing I need to send in? X coordinate, Y coordinate. Oh, okay. Der. So see, it just moves it down a little bit. And you can scroll X or Y. So um, it's one of those things that can be kind of nice if you have, um, if you do game stuff, sometimes you need to like move the screen. Um, there are reasons you might use this. Um, even you, you can even do like auto scroll on certain things. It just depends. It's a nice thing to know exists. Um, now for everything that you can find, there is a link in the outline. that has pretty much everything you can possibly do with the warning that not everything will work in every browser. So keep, be very aware of like these little um, exclamation points, um, which, you know, the API is not been standardized, which means every browser is doing it their own way. If you have the little trash can, um, it is an obsolete API and it's no longer guaranteed to work. This does not mean it will not work because there are many browsers that just kind of keep these around forever. Um, I know there's a, every once in a while I'll run across something where it's like, yeah, they're not, you shouldn't be allowed to use this anymore, but you totally can on every browser um, because it's JavaScript. Um, it's just how it works because each browser does not want to be the one that is suddenly incompatible with web apps that people have been using for five years. Um, and developers aren't always great about checking these to make sure they're going away um, because some web developers um, come from a different world where they wouldn't have to worry about that as much. Um, we are very aware when things go away because we come from the back end. Um, people from the front end come from all different walks of life from being developers that were trained in like other languages to people who started off being front end developers and slowly got into this thing called JavaScript. Um, so just be aware of anywhere where it says obsolete sense or trash can or anything like that. Um, and read only or some things you just can't change. So, but as you can see, there is a lot in window. And as I said, there's a lot of evil stuff in it. So, you know, be careful when you start using it. Um, also, you don't always need to specify window. Let's go back to hello. So if I say, scroll to zero, 
200, it'll work. I personally like to put that window on there if I'm going to do some pure JavaScript because I don't like to assume that the person who comes after me um, is a JavaScript expert and knows like what exactly I'm doing. And it's a whole lot easier to Google window.scroll than it is to Google scroll. So um, that is window. And up, oh, we're at 11.35. We're actually probably going to get out of here as usual early because I'm a fast talker. Um, and I'm going to check the chat really quickly to make sure that everybody's still cool. Scroll by? No idea. Let's look at what scroll by does. Window.scroll by. Scroll the document in the window by the given amount. Oh, that's useful. That's very useful. Let's play with that. So window.scroll, no, by. Um, and we'll just say we're going to scroll down over 0 and 100. So it'll keep moving down. That's useful. Oh, I learned a thing today. Um, so scroll by basically will move it down wherever you are and will move you down a little bit more. Another thing um, I actually didn't have in my notes, so I'm going to make a quick um, addendum. Screen. So you'll also see window.screen. Um, and screen is also available like document on its own. Screen is literally the screen you are looking at. So like what is visible to the person, um, the available height that we have right now is 796. The available width is 1280. Note that it's including my console on that because you know it's not going to worry about us geeks who are going to have our console open. But 1280 is my available width. My color depth is 24 million colors. Um, you know, actual height, actual width, pixel depth, all this kind of stuff, orientation. So you can say, like, I'm on landscape, but if I open this up on a, um, you know, tablet or my phone, it would say, okay, you know your portrait. Um, this is all a lot of really useful stuff if you have to, like, know about what the screen is doing. Um, so it's not as huge. It's not like window that has 9 million things in it, um, but everything in screen is like super important. So I like screen. Um, so some next steps. Do, 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 do. Some next steps. Um, some books I love. I um, One excellent book is JavaScript, The Good Stuff. Um, it's like the most highly rated JavaScript book out there. Um, it's wonderful. And I highly recommend a read through it. And there's a joke that the author wants to go back and write JavaScript, the bad stuff. And that the good stuff, it's it's a small book. It's like really thin. So it goes through all the cool stuff you should be using. Um, the other book that I'm going to recommend is this one, um, Learning JavaScript. It's actually one of the few that I have a physical copy of. Um, because I'm, I'm an O'Reilly, I'm a Safari Books Online geek. Um, Learning JavaScript, it's by Tim Wright. I love this one because I felt like this was the one where a lot of it started to come together for me, um, reading through this. And that he is, you know, he explains why there are some of these oddities. Like, why do some people add parentheses and others don't? Where do the parentheses, not the parentheses, semicolons. Um, where do the semicolons go? When do you need them? When don't you? Um, you know, why does everything look so smushed all the time? And he pulls everything apart and then smooshes it back together and explains why things are smushed sometimes that you have where you don't even bother creating things. You just do everything on the fly. It's a really good book. It's one of my favorite JavaScript books. Um, so those are the two books I'd recommend. There are many more, but those are the two books I always recommend to beginners. Um, resources that I love, that these are the places I go to to learn things. The Mozilla Developer Network, MDN, um, is great. They have an amazing resource of like everything you'd ever want to know. It's kept up to date. Um, it is like zealously maintained. You'll rarely find something where it's no longer relevant. Boku.com, 
is another place they do training. Um, let me pull them up. They do online training. They have free screencasts. Um, I went to one of their like May comps, which was great. Um, so I find a lot of their stuff very useful for getting uh, up to date pretty quickly. Um, be careful about Stack Overflow. Not because Stack Overflow isn't useful, but because the JS jQuery swap is awesome. It is, is common, not awesome, it's horrible. It's common, and sometimes people will call them out on it, and sometimes they won't, and it can get a little confusing. Um, so just be careful when you use Stack Overflow. Um, HTML5 Rocks is another one I love. Um, is another one of the just places I love to go to and find information. Um, they do tutorials and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, stay off of W3 schools. <laughs> just stay off of it. And here's why. It'll often show up in search results. So let's see. If I do a search result for, like here I had the search for Windows. It's It's really, it's like often one of the top ones. There's a problem. Some of the pages are correct. Some of them are absolutely not. <laughs> they have stuff you should not do. They have stuff that's been depreciated. They're not kept up to date. Um, bless their hearts, but don't use them because they will confuse you. They'll put bad code in your head that you think is okay. Definitely use MDN. And it's in fact, when I um, search for things, if I really want the Mozilla one, I will often just append MDN to it so that I know it pops to the top. Because every once in a while, W3C schools, they have the entire first page of results because it's just been around for a while. So that's one of the things that I do, my little hacks. Um, not really a, a hack, it's using search as it's supposed to be used. So about the JavaScript community, um, a bit of a warning, it's huge. Like, if you think the Python community is huge, the JavaScript community is monolithic. I mean, it's enormous. It always blows me away when I see how many people are in it. Um, it moves much faster than us because it has to. We know what our servers do. You know, we know that I'm going to have Python 2.7.1 on my server until I feel like upgrading it. Um, that's just something that I know. And we don't usually have these major upgrades. When you are a JavaScript developer, you're developing for a ton of different browsers that are updating constantly. Um, I recently had one of my add-ons break, one of my little JavaScript add-ons break, because Chrome updated and one of the updates blew out like something they were using and it was probably a value something that was you know um that you know deprecated it was like didn't work anymore but they've kind of ignored it so that's one of the reasons why it'll move much faster um one of the examples of this i'm working in angular js as i've said and it was i think it was like created in 2009 that was like i guess their 1.0 it is called a very mature framework the same year, I believe Flask was started, and Flask is not considered a mature framework. It's considered like a micro framework, and it's great, and people are starting to beginning to really dabble in it and use it for larger things. But that's kind of like if you look at the difference between how we view like how long ago sometime was, like 2009 for us is nothing. That's a new kid. 2009 for them, there are people already saying, well, Angular's aging. And I'm like, it just happened in 2009, you know? Oh my goodness. Um, if you thought Python people were opinionated, um, JavaScript people, because there's more than one day, way to do everything, are very opinionated, especially about their frameworks. The second you step into a framework, and I, I'm Angular, and I'm like, yeah, I use Angular. The first five things I will hear is, well, why aren't you using this framework? Why aren't you using, like, one of these other ones. And I'm like, ah, oh, dude, just let me use what I want to use. Um, so it moves, because it moves faster, there's many more opinions. Just be prepared. You know, if you decide you like a framework, you're probably going to get people asking, why aren't you using this? They're not being mean. It's just that there are a lot of things out there and people have very strong opinions about them. Um, and the code base is huge. There are, um, with like, let's say Python, you've got Django. There's not too many things out there that do what Django does. Like kind of, maybe if you do like Flask, you can piece it together. And But for the most part, we have like, this does this thing. Um, and that's just kind of what happens. And 
with um, JavaScript, there's like five different um, frameworks right now that do what I do. And the differences between them, I'm not an expert. I couldn't tell you. I've read lots of articles <laughs> about it. And they come down to very nuanced differences. Uh, whereas Python, it's kind of like, no, this is the thing. Make your own nuance. Um, so when should you move to a framework? Um, are you going to be dealing with browsers? Then yes, you should move to a framework because they will make working with browsers a whole lot easier. Um, there's a lot of JavaScript that does not work in every browser and they take care of it for you. So while I say learn JavaScript, um, moving to a framework sooner rather than later is a good thing. Um, if you need robust async, you need to move to a framework. It'll make it a lot easier if you need to make a bunch of calls asynchronously. Um, if you don't want to reinvent the wheel, move to a framework because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel. And if you need order in your life, um, move to a framework because JavaScript doesn't really have a lot of self-imposed order um, and frameworks often do. So that's why I like working in frameworks. Uh, some frameworks. Um, since now, you know, play with JavaScript, get to know it a bit, um, and then start to check out some of the frameworks and libraries. jQuery is, of course, one of them. Makes working with the DOM much easier um, and does a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of shortcuts. Um, you should probably get up to it, you know, up to speed on it. Um, AngularJS is just what I use. Um, if you're used to Django, AngularJS will feel really good because everything goes in its little slot and everything goes where it's supposed to and there's lots of style guides and it's like it feels more natural than the wild wild west that is just plain JavaScript. Um, Grunt is a way you can automate certain tasks that you might find yourself doing over and over again. Um, Gulp also might be the new favorite for that. I don't know, I keep hearing the two in the same breath and as I said, moves quickly. Uh, but you're, you're okay with Grunt for now. Stuff I haven't touched, but I've heard is pretty pretty cool. Uh, Node.js is great for two-way connections. So for things like chat, streaming, Node is really cool. Um, I also have a link to a blog post called Why the Hell Would I Use Node.js, which is a great, that was the one that's like, oh, that's why. You also need to have it installed anyway for the package manager, NPM, um, which is actually a lot of them will use um, that package, but kind of like our PIP little bit, not quite, but it's it's a little bit like it. React.js, some people prefer it over Angular. Backbone.js, another one that gets compared to Angular. Ember.js, another one that gets compared to Angular. Animate.css is great for animations. Um, it's not JavaScript, but it pairs really well with it. And uh, there's more. Um, the code base for JavaScript is huge. There's tons of libraries out there. So when you do work in frameworks, just a couple of warnings. Look to see if there's a framework way to do something. Um, that's the, usually the best way to do it. So use that. Um, don't just write your own JavaScript for something like a timeout. You know, Google, like when I do Angular, it's like Angular timeout. And you will find out if there's an Angular way to do it. Um, keep an eye on their compatibility, though. Some of them are better about um, keeping up to date with browsers and versions than others. So keep an eye on that. If you know you have to support like an older version of IE, then make sure to double check that they actually support it. Um, and be careful about mixing. So you probably don't want to mix the libraries together because it can get messy really quickly. So you kind of commit. Like in Angular, you don't want to use jQuery with it. it. has its own version of jQuery in it. Use that. So be careful about mixing. And as usual, I would just Google um, using blah and blah together and see you know, all the cautionary tales that come up. And that is my class. And I hope everybody, I'm releasing everybody early. I didn't know how long this class would take um, because this is the first time running through this material and I'm a fast talker. So I'm gonna check the chat to see if there's any other questions. Oh, another good one is Eloquent JavaScript is a really good book. Um, I recommend it usually after you've read some beginner books. Um, but still very good. And oh, and apparently there's a great go a great Chrome extension that hides W3C schools from your uh, Google results, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I really don't like them at all. Um, and that was linked to in the chat. 
Um, so that is all I have today. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, through Twitter at Kate Cunning or however, any other way you may have found me. And thank you all for attending. Have a great day.